Welcome to part C of chapter 6 in which we talk about price. Price is a central part of the value offer, particularly because price is one of those factors that's used to judge intangible goods and the quality of an intangible good. And just to add a bonus level of complexity to what we're doing with the internet is most of the time we don't get to use financial price as a facet of what we're doing. So let's have a look at pricing theory, how this is going to work and how we can use it to boost our thinking around our value offers. Now top of the list of things is profit is a central idea here. Profit basically is going to be where we have a greater return than we have expenditure. If we look here in terms of the base factors we know for marketing across the board is that there's always a monetary cost and there's always a non-monetary cost. Now in e-marketing, most of the time the monetary cost is hidden. To access the internet requires a subscription fee. But when we're sitting there scrolling through pages on Facebook, we're not thinking, well, this has cost me n number of cents per minute. It's just, well, we pay a monthly bill to access the internet and that's, there's the internet. It's there. Uh, same for mobile phone. We're not sitting there going, well, three minutes and 45 seconds, that was worth $5. It's not the way we think. It's a cost that we don't factor onto when we're engaging in online activity. We will look at things like a mobile phone application and go, how much is that? $1.99? Oh, that's a bit expensive. When we'll also at the same time be going, yeah, I'm not going to buy this app for $2 and spend $5 on a coffee. There's cognitive disconnections. There's referent pricing. There's a whole bunch of stuff in the theory base. But for us, one of the most important facets is that the non-monetary cost is going to be a very important part so that whenever we talk about price, we need to think about it from the total price concept. So when we talk about price sensitivity, we're not just talking about financial, we're talking about people who are going to be sensitive about time costs. We're going to be looking at time versus money as a balance. People who are going to, and particularly when getting into something of all the places, mobile phone based gaming, where you can pay money to in the free to play and pay to play environments, where instead of waiting 30 minutes, you can pay a dollar and skip the 30 minutes. You are then seeing the ultimate market of cash rich versus time poor. Let's take out the total price concept because this is what we're going to focus on for this chapter and this is the critical part for you. What is the cost of engaging with your social media platform? How much time does someone need to spend? What is the effort they will have to exert? What is the correlation connection to their lifestyle? What are the psychic costs? And then what's the sort of perceived costs around with these factors? What does that do in terms of perceptions of quality? So kicking it into time. Time is the one factor that's actually the hardest budget we have. That when we're looking at this in terms of time can be post-purchase. So shipping delays, the delayed gratification, the sense of irony of the fact that a generation brought up buying things on the internet is deemed to have no attention span when they have to wait seven to ten days for stuff coming from the generation who would just take the stuff home from the store instantly. So there are facets here, time, but there's also the idea of the consumption. How long does it take to consume the service? What's the perceived duration? Now. We've all found that moment. You pick up your phone just to check something, it buzzes, you check a tweet, or you check a message, and then you realize it's the coffee is cold, it's been 15 minutes or half an hour, and you don't really have a track of time. You're like, what? 
I was just looking at that. That was, oh. So perceived duration also links to a bunch of other theories that we've had back in consumer behavior about the concept of flow, and the flow states. But you're also looking at this in terms of perceived time cost of reward versus satisfaction. Now, if we take something as basic as Twitter, there's a long learning curve for a lot of people. A lot of people perceive it as a very expensive platform because, well, to start with, you've got to talk about things. So they're learning to become creators. And then comes in the question of, well, where do I get my audience from? How do I find audiences? So there's now a search cost. Some of these things you're starting to rack up bills left, right, center, they're all about time and effort. It's still a free service, still no charge. But if it's perceived to be complex, difficult, and expensive, time expensive and effort expensive, before rewards and satisfaction kick in, it may be the barrier. Similarly, for looking at, a lot of you would have looked at the social media platforms and gone, that's gonna take some work. That's gonna take, that's gonna be a bit of time, which is why you're budgeting. When you're doing your timelines, your budgeting was really critical. What sort of learning curve are we looking at here? What sort of challenge ratio before you start getting payoff and reward? The other aspect here is that time has a very strong link to relative advantage. From a production point of view, faster and quicker is a strategic advantage. It allows you to do cost leadership, time cost leadership. From a consumer's point of view, this whole idea of the 15 second video being, oh, this is an eternity, Vine, seven seconds, all right, now we're in business. The small irony being that TV was the one who gave us seven second attention spans because that's how long you have in news clips. So you basically have time as a budget. It's flexible. Uh, the amount that people can spend in any given duration will vary. And it's also a very competitive audience. People will forego other factors of their life if your time investment is worthwhile. This goes to all of us who have ever mainlined a TV show or gone for, I'll just play this game for an hour and suddenly it's the next day. I'll just watch one more episode on Netflix and the sun is coming up at the end of the credits. I'll just finish this chapter of the book and you started the second volume. And I'll just... At that point in time, you know, uh, you won't just, there'll be more time spent than you budgeted. Second aspect that's really important is effort. And you would have felt this already. What do you have to input into the exchange? What do you basically trade? There's a lot of things here around co-creation of value. You're buying in, you're investing in the outcome. And effort has a factor, particularly if you are going to ask people to comment, leave a comment. Leaving a comment is a cognitive process. It's requiring people to think in reaction to the material. Leave a comment, therefore, is a more expensive effort than give us a thumbs up, a like, or a heart, less effort. Merely look at it and acknowledge my existence by scrolling past, even less effort. So effort does also connect across in terms of pricing. Relative advantage, remembering that sometimes you are selling effort. Where complexity rises and complexity is a feature, effort is something that you raise in order to create value. So effort doesn't always have to be reduced. It's not always a cost to reduce. And this is why you've got to know your audience. Increasing the difficulty level, increasing the challenge, increasing the amount of effort that you need to exert can increase the perceived value. At the same time, simplicity, effort reduction, and effort budget reduction can 
also be a value. So you've got to be careful. Don't make things simple. Don't make things low effort without thinking, is this what my audience wants? Lifestyle. All right, this is one of the biggest ones in e-marketing above and beyond everything else. The internet is now part of people's lifestyles. I'm going to be old for a second and talk about 20 years ago where seeing a URL out in the wild was reasons to stop the car and take a photograph. Now, as it happens, I had a digital camera, but it was, oh my God, that's like the internet. It's the internet outside. Hey, everybody, look, there's a URL. Compared to now, walking past a variety of stores that have the icon of one of the services. They don't even bother telling you the name. You walk past and it's like, oh, there's the Instagram icon or the Twitter icon or the Facebook icon. And sometimes they'll tell you the brand names, other times you have to search for the brand name. The internet's much closer into people's lifestyles now. Mobile phones have been the best thing to have ever happened for distributing the internet. People now have it accessed. So what you now look at is what is the cost of somebody getting involved in the product that you are offering? So if you're offering a club, a society, a service, then people are going to need to shuffle around their lifestyle to make that fit. If you're offering access to entertainment, you're offering access for co-creation, it's got to fit into that person's lifestyle. And lifestyle then links across to compatibility how compatible is what you're offering with what people are currently doing. Remembering that this is a two-way operation. You can sell compatibility. It's your life, slightly better. Or you can sell clash. Tired of your current existence? Try this world. So we can sell contrast and we can sell... Com uh, we can... We can contrast, basically we can sell you something that doesn't fit your lifestyle because you're looking to change, or we can sell you something that's compatible because you're looking to augment your lifestyle. This cost expenditure can also be a revenue. If you think about this from the point of view of you've always wanted to get yourself organized, you always want to get your act together, someone sells you a lifestyle that is about structure and organization, and sells you a to-do list, a task manager, and a little application that'll beep at you to tell you every number of, however many number of minutes a day to drink a glass of water. There you have it, your lifestyle. You're getting revenue, you're getting more back. You're turning a lifestyle profit. And this is the other facet to be thinking, is that when we talk about the total price concept as a cost, we can also think of it as a resource. If my product, my idea that I'm selling across social media, my platform, my content or my the material I curate or the content I create can improve someone's day, can improve their lifestyle, it can be a return to them. So it's not just about what do they spend under co-creation, what do they get back? They might spend time to gain lifestyle. They might spend lifestyle to gain time. You, know, you give up going out on a Friday night to buy yourself those extra hours on the Saturday morning. You're paying lifestyle for time. So these are trades and trade-offs that we can do and we can access and we can budget. We can also then look to how do we turn a profit for our customer. And this the psychic costs, or the psych costs, but I will, will always and forever call it the psychic costs. This is the biggest one with the internet, and that is fear. The internet is incredibly expensive for fear. Uncertainty and doubt are features. That moment where you have that cold sweat of, I don't know what I'm doing. You hit send on an email and you have that sense of dread. You post something and just after you post, it is the cognitive dissonance clarity where you can see the six 
different grammatical and spelling errors you made in 144 characters that you could not see just before you hit the post button. This is the cost. And this is where observability, trialability, and compatibility come in. But basically, this is your self-esteem as a budget. Now, the thing is, I've got the ego the size of a star system. I've got a budget in this area that is immense. I can take a heck of a lot of fear, and I can take a lot of doubts. And that's why I'm in the innovator class, because I can take a lot of damage. I can spend a lot of my psyche because the return I get, the payoff that I get is around the belief, the attitude and the values. So psyche is the big expensive part about the product. What you spend here also pays off though. What you're looking at here is if we can sell, remember some people will buy fear. Some people will sell fear as well, but some people want that uncertainty. They want that moment of, what have I done? These are the people who watch horror movies. These are people who go out to watch a cinematic 120 minutes of knowing that bad things are about to take place. They fascinate me. I don't get it, but they fascinate me because there's a cost, but there's a profit. So Psy... Psychic profit is a big part of the product, and so the whole idea of the content, the idea, the attitude, and the belief. So this, well, this basically is an aspect that does have a significant role. It does raise barriers, but it can also turn out to be, because it's resolved through cognitive dissonance, and we know from consumer behavior that a positive resolution of cognitive dissonance has a significantly more powerful brand loyalty. So we know that these factors are in play. The profits you turn here are immense, but the costs you incur here are also huge. So the last two critical parts of this that need to be considered. In services marketing theory, we talk about the price quality trade-off. The more expensive something is, the more people are willing to assume that it is high quality if there's no other evidence than just the price. Inherently, most people think that they are logical creatures who are smart shoppers and we're getting value for money here, not getting ripped off. The price-based positioning is very important because what you tend to see is high price being thought of in terms of financial. So high financial price tends to imply high quality. The more expensive it is, the better it is. But if you also come back to that and go complexity, time, a high time cost implies something about the audience. It implies something about the benefits, the cost of trade-off. It also then the high, you know, a high lifestyle cost can give a certain perception of quality. So you want to be thinking about this in terms of the manipulation. You want to be thinking about what is the most important facet here. You also want to, from your own social media presences, be thinking, what is the total, what is the total price of engaging with my brand? If in order to engage with my brand, you've got to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, YouTube, and get a Vox account. Oh, while you're at it, it's probably, you should probably go to Bandcamp as well. And FYI, I've got this new application out. You should totally download it. That's really expensive. People may not necessarily buy in, but those who do buy in are going to feel that it's like, oh, wow, this is good quality. I'm getting the exclusives. So channel price also becomes important. How many different channels, how much investment, this crosses over to distribution. How many different points do people need to engage with you to get the maximum value? So you want to be very calculative. You want to be very much a marketer in the sense of going, what's it worth, what's it cost, 
and what does it do to the perception of the overall product? What does the financial and non-financial price do in terms of changing the idea? Changing the idea of the product. What does it do in terms of affordability, which comes back to the SIVA model of access? So think about this because you're mostly selling time and effort and psyche. You can, some of you are selling lifestyle, but most of the time, or most of the accounts that you'll come across sell time, sell effort. So the more complicated it is, the harder it is to interpret what's going on in your social media message, unless it's intentionally meant to be an exclusive club of in-jokes that if you get it, share it. If you don't get it, then you're not the audience. Wouldn't have someone who wouldn't join a club who'd have someone like me type of approach. All of these are pricing decisions for you to make to see whether they fit your audience. And this is why segmentation is critical. What is high quality, what is a high perceived quality based on price for one audience is getting ripped off by another audience. So you've got to make certain you've got your audience right and your audience knows that what they're trading is giving them a personal profit, that they're getting something extra back. So as always, the cheapest way to contact me is email. The midway to contact me is over Twitter. And the most expensive is to show up face to face because you've actually got to make your way out to campus and see me. And for some of you who are operating from remote, that's not cheap. Price is the big one. Price is the edge, by the way. If you master non-financial price, it gives you an edge over any marketer who only ever thinks in terms of currency symbols and financial prices. So this is a good one to get the hang of.